Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Social Media 101. We really appreciate you joining Juan today, and we're very excited to hear from our own Jesse Calkins. My name is Azivo Kiwa, and I am the Senior Program Associate here at WAND, and I will be running the back end of the technology today. Before we get started with the presentation, just a few housekeeping items. All attendees will be muted during the presentation. If you have any questions uh, for Jesse, please type them using the questions section of your panel. It's on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, after Jessie finishes her presentation, I'll ask these questions to her aloud. And if you have any technical difficulties, please contact GoToWebinar Support directly. Their phone number is 1-800-263-6317. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and introduce Jessie Calkins. Uh, so Jessie Calkins is the Communications Officer here at WAND. She supports all of our communications, design, and media relations work. She studied linguistics at Boston University and has a variety of uh, communications experience from the hospitality industry, industry excuse me, to the cycling industry, and also has a very wide variety of social media expertise. She manages our Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr accounts, which she's going to tell you more about, and she's an all-around great person to work with. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse to tell us more about social media. Jesse? Hello, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we're going to be covering Social Media 101. So you're going to get a little bit of background of what is this whole social media business about and a little bit about what to do about all of it. We're going to be coming from a pretty beginner perspective. So if you're an old hand at Twitter and you've got a couple hundred thousand followers, um, Send us your wisdom for part two. So we're going to get started here. And I'm going to try to put social media in the perspective of traditional media, like magazines, newspapers, things that we've always thought about as how to get our message out. We always knew, I mean, at least for my entire life, about print media. It's something that came on the doorstep. Someone delivered it. We subscribed to a service for information. It was great. And didn't matter what city you travel to, you could get access to the news in that place too. So we would be able to, as an organization, as a company, as an individual, we would be able to submit pieces of writing, be them opinion pieces, letters to the editor, what have you, to get our coverage up, to get coverage of us out there. We could have our age-old tools of press releases, press releases, media advisories, we could try to pitch papers to write about us in a column. We could have big events to try to get a lot of press coverage. Um, you know, the time-honored press conference. And these things are still very potent tools today and part of any well-thought-out media plan, any well-thought-out organizational messaging system. But there was always someone else, always an editor, always someone else who is the final arbiter of this content. And so, Will we get placed? Will we get coverage? Will any press show up to our conference? Questions that we have always, always had to ask. And the best of the best always knew how to package messaging to get this stuff covered. And this continues. But there's a new dimension. And we've seen this grow over the past couple of decades. You know, the World Wide Web, the Internet, or as some people call it, the interwebs. These have all changed how we've messaged and how we've communicated from person to person. Back in the day, we had weblogs, which we call blogs now. We saw respected print media become web media. We've seen respected websites be only on the web now. And so we saw, the, besides that, the advent of systems like Friendster and MySpace from back in the day. Before we ever had this, this phrase called social media, we had these networks um, in the early 2000s, 2003, 2004, in the college scene, Facebook became a thing. And back then it was called The Facebook. And now it's changed and it has millions of users. We have Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, YouTube, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Google+, more than you could even imagine that you've never even heard of. App.net, tons and tons of possible places where we could connect with people who we've never met, share our messages, 
and reach out beyond to people who have never heard us or people who are waiting to hear us to get our message out there, to get activists moving, to get the word out. And so this entire breadth and depth of a new way of sharing we call new media. Maybe 10 years from now we'll be calling it something else. But sometimes we call it social media. And a few years ago, a gentleman named Seth Gilgan wrote a, a book that has kind of become a seminal publication in, in marketing for, for companies. And it was called Purple Cow, Transform Your Business by Being Remarkable. And the philosophy that he talks about in this book has spread across to activist networks, to political campaigns, to small businesses, large businesses, to individuals who make a name for themselves, even just on the web as personalities. And what is the idea behind this? This is the connectivity economy, or the economy of connection. And basically, it's really the oldest idea out there. It's not so much, you know, you spend so much money here and you get these many ads and then people buy your things or people subscribe to your message. It's who do you know and what do you have to say and how great is it that you have these connections and that you can take advantage of them. And so what this connectivity economy has given us is a way of telling our own story. And so just to make sure that I haven't lost you, there is more to social media than cat videos. Now, how about I have your attention again? We have to start with the right questions. Before we get into which network, what are metrics, what's my demographic, how do I get more hits on my website, do I have the right followers? Before we get to that, we have to ask the right questions. And those questions are very, very simple ones. And they're ones that you would ask no matter what kind of messaging you're doing, no matter really what kind of background you're coming from, be it advertising or just a person who wants to connect with their friends on the web. We have to ask ourselves, who is our audience? Who do we want to reach? And who are we actually reaching? So if you are a person or an organization and you already have a social media account set up, you can look at your followers or your fans and, and read what they have to say about themselves. Who are these people? Are these the people who you've been wanting to connect to? Maybe they're all people you know in person. And then you took that connection from a person-to-person -person encounter and you connected online. Or maybe it's someone you met across the country or across the world who you've never met in person, but you share the same dream or the same goal for changing the world. And maybe that's how you met. And if you're finding that the people who are your fans or are your followers are your any number of different words we have, it's usually follower or friend or fan in most of these media outlets online. If you're finding that the people who are following you or that you're connecting with are the people who you've always wanted to reach, then that's great. You're doing the right thing. But if you have a, an anonymous mess of questions, who are these people? Are these just all spam bots following my Twitter account? Then we have a lot of work to do. And maybe if you're just starting out, this is a great time to really ask these questions. Why are we starting out here? What is the goal of our work? Because it's great. You can have a Twitter, a Tumblr, a Facebook, an Instagram. But unless you're answering these questions at the beginning with how you set it up, how you choose your logo or what images are going to place, you know, this will help guide you from the very, very beginning. So let's continue. So we're going to talk about content in a minute. I'm going to go back to these three prime questions because we're going to go through and we're going to look at these different options for social media. And you're going to get to see my own internet situation on my own machine here as we go to the live internet. All right. So here we have the joy that is PowerPoint. And here we have the different things where you can find one on the web. So this is our actual live right now logged in Twitter screen. And you can see that we have our logo. This is Women's Action for New Directions. And why is our username Women's Action? Because probably one was taken. Here's the thing about Twitter. Most of the most sought after usernames have the fewest characters because 
characters come at a price point, not a literal monetary amount on Twitter, but you only get 140 characters to say what you want to say. And so a username, the shorter it is, probably was taken a long time ago when the first users of Twitter were out there. So we're at Women's Action. So if you can follow my mouse, this app sign here, that denotes a username in case you're new to Twitter. And what follows after that, that's us. So if you tried to try to find us on Twitter before and you looked for at one, you probably got somebody else. This is us, and this is our mission statement. So you can see that we've tweeted 1,928 times. We're following 800, some around, we're around 800 people. We've got a little more than 1,000 followers. These are all the things that we've said lately. Now, sometimes you'll see that there's messages from other people. Those are called retweets. We'll want, that's who the legislators want you. This is our program that works with state legislators. So you'll see back here our pace setters. That was a great event that we had earlier this year. And you'll see on the side here, if you haven't really interacted with Twitter before, recent media that we've posted. You could see other tweets that we have favorited, lists. Uh, when we had our recent conference in Washington, D.C., the National Women's Leadership Conference called Women at the Tables of Power, we made a list of every single participant so that they could find each other on the web in case they didn't know each other before. Sometimes Twitter will recommend people for you to follow and you find those over here. And then you have trends. Now, today is Thursday, so pretty much every Thursday you're going to see hashtag TBT, which means throwback Thursday. And people will frequently post pictures of things that they were doing a long time ago. It's mostly a kind of a colloquial thing, but you'll even see organizations and companies using this to show pieces of their own history. So why am I telling you about Throwback Thursday? Because this very potent little number sign is called a hashtag. And hashtags have a lot of different functions. One is that they make tweets searchable. So if you had an event like we did at our National Women's Leadership Conference, and you wanted to make sure that everyone at your event was talking along the same line and could find other conversations, you could create a hashtag that everyone at the conference or your party or whatever your event was could use to describe it. And so ours for our conference was called Women's Power Peace. And so if you had searched that up here in the search bar, then let's say that we did that. And Twitter is always going to try to populate this for you, going to try to guess what you want. But we're not going to search for people. We're searching for a hashtag. So it's going to give you a person first and foremost. But the other things that you can do is that you can go over to Discover. And this is the best place, really, to search for hashtags. Now, this is a couple of months ago. So you might not see anything particularly new, because we were using this for our conference. And we're still getting the same results. I'll have to go back to that later. I'm going to cover a couple of other things in here. So the nice thing about Twitter is, and this is logging in on just Twitter.com, there's a lot of tools you can use to interact with Twitter, like TweetDeck or HootSuite. But we're going to talk more about that next week. These are interactions. These are people who have spoken to us or retweeted us or followed us recently. Discover is things that are trending now, things that are people are talking about now. And that's really what makes Twitter what it is. It's people talking about what's happening right now. You might have heard about all of the things that happened with Wendy Davis and her filibuster at, in the Texas State Senate earlier this year. And most of the people who came to support her, and most of that was all on Twitter. It wasn't really being covered in major news outlets. So if you have an event and you have something that's happening now, Twitter's really great for that. And it's great because it challenges us to say what we have to say in less words. So here's another great example of a hashtag. So this says USNAP and WPS. Well, what are those? Well, we work on women, peace, and security here in WAND, and that was a UN initiative that really started in 2000. But December 19th is the second anniversary of the US National Action, National, I'm sorry, US Na National Action Plan. And that's what this USNAP stands for. So other organizations that work on women, peace, and security will mark their tweets about it with this hashtag, USNAP. And others will sometimes use WPS for women, peace, and security. So if I wanted to find other tweets that had USNAP, I could use this. 
the thing is, is that sometimes different organizations will choose the same hashtag, which is why common ones can be a little bit difficult. Other things that one works on are gender-based violence. Um, just this past Tuesday was the last day of 16 days of action that we contributed in for that, and that's what this GBV is. So moving on to some of the other social media outlets, we have our friend Facebook, who has so many users, you've all probably encountered it in one way, shape, or form. This is our main fan page, and the nice thing about both Facebook and Twitter is that you have the opportunity to have more images. The main Twitter page can populate with images now. It used to not be the case. You used to have to click through to get the images. Facebook, on the downside, where Twitter is going to show you everyone that you follow in real time, the Facebook algorithm has changed over the years. And so it used to be that when you went to the home screen, you would see everything your friends were talking about. But now the algorithm selectively delivers uh, commercials, advertisements, and only some of what your friends and followers are talking about and posting right now. So just because someone has liked your page, it doesn't always mean that they're going to see your content. So if you pay to have advertising on Facebook, then there's another way to get people to pay attention to you. But if you're a nonprofit organization and you're trying to get your word out and you don't have a huge budget, you're going to have to understand that your pickup for each action you take on Facebook might not be what it used to be a few years ago, especially maybe if you've used Facebook here and there, or if you use Facebook as an individual and not an organization. So this is Facebook. Facebook also owns Instagram. Instagram is a photo sharing service. Now, you might see this if you use Facebook. Some of your friends, you have different pictures with these different filters. We got on Instagram right before our conference so that we could share what was happening in real time. We were visited by Congressman Donna Edwards because she was our torch bearer. And you can zoom into these pictures. And the main purpose of Instagram is that it's used on mobile phones. So if you are a top-of-the-line photographer and you hate automatic filters, then you might not be the biggest fan of Instagram. But for many of us amateur photographers, it really helps us show our friends and our followers what we're doing and what we have to say. And as we know, frequently, a picture can be worth more than words. And Instagram is a good way to share that. And here's another example of tie-ins. So because Facebook owns Instagram, it's very easy to connect the two. It's also very easy to connect your Twitter to your Facebook. But you probably don't want to do that. Why would you not want to? It would be so easy. I can share one thing on Twitter, and then it goes everywhere. But here's the thing. The people who are on Twitter, the people who are on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, each and every one of these networks has their own culture, their own way of interacting with other people. Different things that work really well on one might not work so well on the other. And so when you're making your decisions about how do I get my message out? Where do I want to be? It takes a little bit of observation, or maybe talking to someone who's a really great user of one of these networks to decide, what's the best vehicle for my message? One of the things that Wand has gotten into recently is Tumblr. Tumblr is a blogging service. It actually started off as an art site where people could share images. It has a lot of great things about it. Um, one is that it's very easy to make compelling design. You can choose from a number of templates that are free, or you can purchase them. And it can give your work a very streamlined appearance. Once again, it ties in with both Twitter and Facebook very, very easily. The other great thing about it is you'll see here 43 notes, reblogged one day ago. You can, rather than say on Twitter where you can retweet, which is like what I showed you over here on our main page, we shared something from the women legislators lobby. We clicked the retweet button, and so it, so it took their message and reposted that on our wall. You have here on Tumblr, you can repost an entire post from someone else. And if you just think that the internet might be about cat videos, that's also not the case. There's a lot more people on Tumblr and a lot more organizations and publications on Tumblr than you might realize. We follow the Atlantic. Think Progress is on here, even the State Department. You might recognize this as an Instagram photo. The Atlantic again, they post a lot. That's another question you have to start asking yourself. How much do I want to post? The New Yorker's on here. 
there's uh, Senate charts is great, especially if you follow the ins and outs of what's happening in the Beltway in DC. You have to ask yourself, how much do I want to post? We're going to talk more about the fine tune strategy next week on, on next week's webinar. But I'm going to talk about a few more of these that we have going on. So the next one I'm going to show you is YouTube. And you might not think of YouTube as a social network. But the page that I'm showing you right now is a pair of brothers who actually started a very successful online community just by sending video blogs to each other a few years ago. You might notice that they have over a million subscribers. Video blogs or blogs are becoming a very, very popular and effective way of getting your message out. People can like them and comment on them. And you can have episodes week by week. This group, for instance, has a crash course on chemistry or US history. So there's a lot of different kinds of programming that you can share with people. So both YouTube and Google Plus are owned by Google. So if you run a YouTube channel or you want to post on YouTube, you're going to have to have a Google Plus account because all of the comments on YouTube are now tied to Google Plus. This is the State Department's Google Plus account. Earlier this year, Secretary of State John Kerry, who you might, if you're from Massachusetts, might remember him from our state government, they hosted a Google Hangout with the Secretary of State. So even the heads of state are getting into this. You can scroll down through here to see different links that they've shared, different images, and different videos. So you're going to see a lot of that from one to the other. You can see the use of hashtags here, even in Google+. From one form of social media to the other, hashtags help you keep track of a conversation, and they help you search for things. So understanding what a hashtag is and how to use one effectively, can one help you make sure that your message and what you're sharing is seen by people who are looking for that item. So let's say we wanted to shout out to the State Department or we were commenting on something that the State Department was doing. We would try to find ahead of time if there was an established hashtag, like this one here, the State Department likes to tag their things as State Department, and we would use that to make sure that what we had to say became as part of this comment. Now, Secretary of State Kerry doesn't really maintain his own account, so you'll see that he's mentioned as hashtag Sec Kerry here. This is a pretty frequent way of referring to him on Twitter as well. Former Secretary of State Clinton, uh, as in Hillary Clinton, has her own Twitter account. So in that case, if you were on Twitter, you would use the at sign in her username, which you could find through search. So just a couple more social networks here. So this is the general LinkedIn page. They have a number of different services that they offer that they use not. The, the prime point of LinkedIn is that it is a professional network for people to connect through their professional identities. So whereas Facebook requires you to use your real name and is more based on your family school relationships because it began as a connection, a connection for college students and you see that perpetuated and then the addition of who you work for came later. LinkedIn came on, it was, its advent was for professional connections. So you'll see different things and you'll see this, this word influencers. Who are influencers? They're tend to be, one, people who have a lot of followers, but two, they're people, people whose opinions are shared and whose voice matters in their topic areas. So no matter what kind of social media you use, if you have an influencer who follows you or who listens to what you have to say, then that is kind of a benchmark. You can say, you know, I'm making it somewhere in social media because, you know, I'm interacting with this influencer. Or, you know, if you're really good, you can reach out to reporters and you can use this in a very direct way to influence and enhance your traditional media work. One more here from the list that we said we would cover. This is Pinterest. This is just the Pinterest main page. Now the main point of Pinterest is photo sharing. So if you are a company who is using you know, fashion or any of the many of things you see here, this can be a very effective way of doing that. Because one, most of our work has a lot to do with advocacy and on other parts we have a membership base in our will base, we have pictures, but we decided that we weren't going to become really involved in Pinterest because it really didn't seem like the best way of getting our message across. But I wanted to show you what it was, and once again, Pinterest can be connected to 
Facebook so that if you were following pins, which is what these individual posts are called, you could share that across the other social media branches. So that's kind of what all of these look like. But once again, you're probably wondering, how do I pick? So let's go back over here. So we've asked the right questions. And we have an idea of maybe where we want to go and what we want to do, or really what we'd like to do, or what we'd like to see happen. We'd like to have a million followers on Twitter and have people just with waiting with bated breath for everything that we have to say. Well, this is where content comes into play. So like we said earlier, every social media network has its own culture, as it were. Different ones came of age in different communities. I was in college when Facebook started. So I was one of those college kids who started using it. I didn't get onto Twitter until maybe it was a couple of years old. I have friends who are early adapters to these different media outlets. So how we use them and the fluency with which we use them can really depend not so much on our age, but perhaps what we're interested in. Maybe if you're a software developer, maybe you've been using app.net since it began. But maybe if you're not in that field, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be there. I know you might see that I'm leaving you with an awful lot more questions than I'm answering. But I'll get you started with a few of the cultural markers of some of these different kinds of media outlets. So we've got Facebook. Visual things tend to get ranked or filtered by the Facebook algorithm so that, like I said before, not everyone's going to see it. If there's a picture attached, there is a much greater chance that that will be seen in someone's news feed. Similarly, a photo, a video, or a link share, there's more likely that those are going to be seen than just a status update. And you can ask for what you want on these different things. You can say, hey, please share this, or hey, please retweet this. But don't say that all the time, because people get turned off by it. That's the thing about social media. It's social. It requires engagement. You can sit quietly in the background on Twitter and just read, but it's good to exchange ideas and perspectives. Well, let's say you're like one, and you have different areas of things that you work on, from you know nuclear disarmament to women, peace, and security to redirecting the Pentagon budget. Well, who on my staff is going to run that social media account? And what if I've got an intern or someone who's doubling up in three different staff positions who doesn't have enough time or maybe isn't a policy expert? That's where teamwork comes in. It's very important to have a very straightforward and transparent approach to this. It, it's good to sound like a person, but you're an, if you're an organization, then there's some things you're not going to weigh in on. I'm going to take you over to Twitter again. And we're going to look back at Twitter. And we're going to see some organizations that have two different or three different accounts. Our friends over at Plowshares that work on nuclear weapons work, this is their main organizational account. They share different things from the organizations they work with and valid pieces of news and policy updates. One of their head is Joe Serencioni, and I do apologize if I say his last name wrong, but he has the opportunity as one of the heads to give a more personal view on these different things that Plowshares might also share. Because he's a person and not an organization, although organizations are made of people, he can have more of an opinion side and can add in things about sports or just you know, everyday life that people who would use social media would say. So this is another situation you might find yourself in. Maybe you're one of the executive directors of an organization. Do we have an organization account or a spokesperson account? How do we decide? You can see some different ways that this is done well for activist organizations. One of our friends' organizations is Peace Action. They're an activist organization, and they help mobilize their activists and share different pieces of policy that they'd like people to take action on using their account. And they also talk to individuals to bring up valid pieces of work that they'd like brought to the light. One of their field organizers is Judith LeBlanc. And she has her own Twitter account. And she behaves a little bit differently. 
than an organization would. You'll see that she would retweet a lot of things that you just saw on the Peace Action account. But then again, she's going to interact a little bit differently because this is her account. This isn't the organization account. And so you can, especially if you're new and you think you might end up being the person in charge of the organization account, it's good to maybe make kind of a backdoor secret personal account where you can watch and see how people act on Twitter, especially if you're new. Because it's a very, very different kind of interaction than you're used to from Facebook. So I'm going to go over to one other example of the two National Priorities Projects, which also works on federal budget issues like us. If you ever want any facts, this is a great place to find them. They release a lot of reports and things like that here on their Twitter feed. And this is another great reason that you would use social media, is to share your different reports, if that's the kind of an organization you are, to say, mobilize your activists. Now, Joe Comerford is the head of National Priorities Project, and this is her personal account. You'll see maybe she doesn't have quite so many followers, but she retweets a lot of National Priorities content. So I'm going to go back over here, and we're going to look at correct content. So what's FTW? It's for the win, if you don't use short things. Um, if you're going to run a social media account, it's good to learn some of these abbreviations, because even if you're not going to use them, other people are. And it makes your internet fluency a lot greater. So quality over quantity. It's better to start with a small group of people who care an awful lot than it is to start with a vast following of exactly who are these people. And that comes back to that initial question of who do we want to reach and who are we reaching? And saying things that matter and not just to fill the silence. It can be tempting to just tweet away all day, I'm eating a peanut butter sandwich. Guess what our office did? We took our interns out to lunch today. This is a really nice thing to do. But is that a personal thing, or is that an organizational thing? So think before you tweet, before you post, before you blog, or microblog, or before you post that picture. Because one of the reasons that I've got this empty picture frame here is if you've got nothing to say, people will stop listening. But if you say the wrong things at the wrong times, or if you say things when no one's listening, like if you're going on and you're tweeting for your organization's account at 6.30 in the morning, not as many people are going to see that until you do it a little bit later in the day. So there's great tools to schedule your social media posting. But really, these things were designed to react in a human way. So obviously not every organization or every person can be on social media all day, every day, because when, when would we do the rest of our jobs? But to react in a human way, to be there and participate in these engagements in real time as much as we can, this will help us. Earlier this year, when the events in Syria were at the forefront of the news, several of our coalition organizations, especially when without war, they led what is called a Twitter chat or a tweet chat or a Twitter town hall. They have a number of different names. And it was marked with the hashtag Syria costs. And basically, it was a question and answer session with some of their policy people talking about what's happening in Syria and what would be different decisions that would, that would or could be made um, either policy-wise or legislatively or by the president. What would the costs and what would the effects of this be? And so we were able to learn and participate in this conversation because it's something that we were paying attention to as well. And not only did we have the opportunity to interact with new people who did not know about us in the past, but we were able to learn a lot more ourselves. So when we create content that is the right thing for the right social media outlet at the right time, then we create a community of people who want to hear what we have to say, who tell others, and who want to connect with us. And this helps us build a community. So especially if you're an activist organization, this is a great way to reach out to people. Lately, um, back at the very end of September, beginning of October, uh, especially the first day of the government shutdown, um, we at WAND and WILL, our program with, of women state legislators, once again at our National Women's Leadership Conference, Women at the Tables of Power, we had started our conference with the hashtag WomenPowerPeace. That was just supposed to demarcate 
which, which parts of the conversation were about our conference versus other things. But later on, when the shutdown became eminent, we started using shutdown the shutdown. And the women and other participants of our conference started using it. And then other people on Twitter started using it. And it grew outside of our community, outside of DC, outside of people who maybe even knew who we were. And it was trending. What does trending mean? It means that there's an awful lot of users on Twitter using that phrase for a very concentrated period of time. So like that thing I showed you earlier, that Throwback Thursday, that's something that's trending. A lot of people are using it. Well, our shutdown, the shutdown, that was trending. When you're trending, a lot more people run into you. You might also hear something like that referred to uh, as viral. So when a, a video goes viral, millions of people see it. And there's entire services that are, are based on this, online curating sites like uh, Upworthy or BuzzFeed or Think Progress. We can talk more about those next week. And just want to say that when you have a well put together and a well executed social media presence, even if it's starting small, it can really support the work that you do in traditional media. Because what we did on Twitter was so loud for so long, many of our women's state legislators at our conference were approached by traditional media, by radio stations, by newspapers for interviews. They wanted to know what these women leaders and what our community leaders had to say about the matter because everything had been so loud in social media. So it's not just cat videos. So when we get really good at it, when we're practiced, when we have confidence, Ideally, our content should be anticipated by our audience. It should be personal to them, maybe not saying, hey, congratulations on your engagement. Not quite that personal, but personally moving or personally relevant and relevant in terms of the news, the content, like I said before, not just to fill the silence. So if you're looking for things that Wanda does on the internet, and if you want to look at this webinar later, uh, especially on YouTube, we have a collection of our webinars available. That's the link at the bottom there. This is where some of the places where you can find us. We'll probably be growing into new places as time goes on. And we're always trying to improve how we do things. So as you go through this and you're wondering, oh goodness, she's given me so many different kinds of social media and so many different things to think about. But as daunting as all of this can seem, please remember that it's always changing. And that it means as humans, as users of this media, as people who are trying to get a message out, that we're going to keep on finding new ways to share our message, to reach other people, to give them hope or change the world or make our campaign move forward, whatever it is we're trying to do. And as these things continue to evolve, we're going to make them better. So maybe Twitter makes you annoyed or you don't like Instagram so much. Give it a few years. There'll be a, there's, you know, I didn't even cover Snapchat. It didn't really seem like a thing to cover for us right now. And don't worry about Snapchat right now. But the idea being that this is going to keep growing and changing. And even if you're thinking, oh, goodness, I, it's way too late for me to get involved now, it really isn't because every day something new is popping up. And every day you can decide to create content that matters. You can get a little risky and decide to be a leader can dare to matter, and you can dare to reach out to the different people who are waiting to hear your message. So that's the end of my formal presentation for 101, and we're always happy to hear your questions for part two, which will be next Thursday at 3. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them, Ms. Udzi. Thank you so much, Jesse. That was really great, very detailed, and very informative. Um, I just want to remind everyone how to ask questions. So if you have a question for Jessie about her presentation, you can type them in using the question uh, section on your uh, attendee panel. It should be on the right-hand side. Just type your questions, and they'll come to me, and then I'll read them out loud to Jessie. Um, and while we're giving folks a couple of minutes to uh, get their questions together, I'm going to ask the first question. Um, so Jesse, as of course you know, uh, most of our audience are, uh, are activists or community leaders in some sense. Um, and so what do you think are the best 
social media outlets for, um, for activists and for state legislators to use to get their message across? So the, the two social media networks that have the largest audience are just by sheer numbers Twitter and Facebook. I think at last count, Facebook had, oh gosh, around almost over 4 million, around almost a billion users. It's, it's getting a little excessive, but in a good way. And, and Twitter. So if you looked at the White House or at Barack Obama's campaign, his campaign managers, especially on their social media, has been incredibly successful. White House has 4.5 million followers. It, Twitter is a very great place to introduce short, poignant pieces of policy observation. Um, one of our Will members, uh, Jessica Farrar, she is a Texas state representative. When we were in Washington, D.C. for the shutdown, her meeting with one of her uh, members of Congress was canceled. And so she wrote a note and stuck it on the door and posted a picture of that on Twitter. And it was retweeted a couple of thousand times, I think. And if you're trying to get the message out in a very poignant, quick, real-time way, Twitter's your best bet. If you want to start building events and a community of people who are going to keep checking back to your page for maybe longer-term projects, you would want to use Facebook for that. It's a great place to start events. Let's say you're going to run a campaign or you have an activist movement to, uh, let's talk about, say, Oregon Wand for a moment. Um, they're one of our chapters, and one of them at the least, but usually quite a few of them, participate in a peace march. And it goes for a couple of hundred miles. And if you wanted more people to participate in that, you could create an event on Facebook, and you could invite all of your friends. And the one thing is that you really have to to reach out in a very active way on Facebook because people aren't always are not always going to see it in their newsfeed because it gets filtered, like I said, by the algorithm. And you'll find a lot more advertising taking up space in Facebook right now. Um, although Twitter is about to be a publicly traded company, their advertising may change. And that can always change how our messages are received. Thank you, Jesse. Um, our next question is from Josie Haddon. Uh, Josie says, this all seems so fleeting. What if you want to develop an idea and build on it? Then which outlet should you use? Well, my question would be, what kind of an idea? Are you trying to start a brand new social movement, something that we've never seen before? Or maybe a project at the community level? Maybe you would want to change your local tax code. There is a, uh, a great story of the Troy Library, if, um, if you're talking more local. And these, this library was suffering from lack of funds. And there's a, a great video which I can provide in the follow-up materials to this webinar, because I can't give you anything with sound right now. But the, the story of this library is that they were able to rouse enough people in the town to care using Facebook and Twitter to change the policies at the local level and get enough money raised, and this was you know, through local tax ordinances, to save this library. And that was all through the power of social media. The tools themselves might seem fleeting, but it's really what you use the tool for. Tools change over time. Maybe 200 years ago, I would have written a lot of letters. And maybe 100 years from now, I can never imagine what kind of technology we might have. But it's more of a message than the tool. So if you want to use the most powerful tools we have now, then this is a great place to look. Because we saw what Wendy Davis was able to do in Texas. We've seen what Commander Hatfield, who was the head of the International Space Station, was able to do with tweeting from outer space and the attention he was able to bring to the space program. So. It does matter because it could be that one message that that one person receives that one time on Facebook or Twitter that changes their life or helps them find the cause that they were waiting for their entire lives. 
because they just happen to be there at the right time. Thank you, Jesse. Um, our next question is from Lori Benj. Uh, Lori said, Lori asks, uh, you said that each of the different social medias easily connect to each other. So can you explain uh, why you suggest not using that feature, or uh, if there are any cases where it might be good to have them connect? So one of the things that you can do is you can, every single time you post on Facebook, you can have it tweet for you. And what those tweets look like is more or less, I'm, I'm really hoping that I don't see any, because I would be sad if I did. Ah, here we go. This person just, fb.me is a uh, shortened Facebook link. This has no context. This link isn't really telling us anything. And what if I don't have a Facebook account? What if I can't see what this content is? So if you have something that's auto-tweeting for you because you posted on Tumblr or you posted on Facebook, then it's showing the users of the other media that you're not investing the time to share that content on that network. And in case someone reacts to it, you're not there to probably get a notification, but you're not there to react in real time. Cultivating the audiences on the different platforms might seem like an exhausting task, but it's your opportunity to reach new people. I mean, I know some people who only use Twitter and hate Facebook. I know other people who love Facebook, and that's the only one they ever use. So cultivating unique audiences and offering unique content to each form is very valuable. You wouldn't try to deliver a radio interview to a movie theater full of people. So we want to send the right messages to the right people. And if I was ever going to connect any of them, if I was in a position that I needed a lot of images to be shared quickly across the different media, especially if it was a very play-by-play, -play, like uh, Wendy Davis at Filibuster, and I was on Instagram, I would tie my Instagram to my Facebook and my Twitter and my Tumblr and make sure that what I was taking pictures of live in that moment were broadcasting across all of the media. The only time I'd ever say connect them is if you're sharing pictures. But remember, if you are the administrator of a Facebook fan page as opposed to a friend page, and you access it by your personal account, and for some reason you accidentally connected them to your work Twitter, and you're taking a picture of your cute little baby niece, you don't necessarily want your policy organization or your activist organization having a referred thing that says, look at my cute baby niece, because she might be cute but it's not the correct content at the right time. Good advice, Jesse. Um, our next question is from Representative Tina Liebling, and Representative Liebling, Liebling asks, can elected officials use social media to get out our message and still have any private use? How can we keep these separate? Well, you can see a couple of different examples of how different campaigns have done this, and I'll use the White House and the President as an example, although everything the President does is a matter of public record. So we have the White House account, which is different things that the White House is dealing with. So you'll see a lot of the President covered here, but you see a lot of policy things covered here. And then you can look at, say, uh, Barack Obama himself. So he was on Twitter prior to being the president when he was a senator. And you see he has 40 million followers, so he as an, as an individual originally um, was has more followers in the White House. And you can see that this account is run by Organization for Action Staff. So um, you can see that the president signs them dash B for Barack O for Obama. And you can mix it up like this, where you have different messages from the individual and different messages from the campaign or the, the team that runs with the legislator, or you can have it come from the office. The, the really nice thing about uh, Twitter is that it offers these verified accounts, which is not something you can sign up for a verified account. It's an internal decision that Twitter does on the back end, and they have not released the details of how different accounts are verified, which can be frustrating to some people, especially legislators who are just getting started here. But really, 
the best thing to do would be decide, I want my office to run my account, and we're just going to have approved messaging go out. And every once in a while, I will find a tweet and we'll mark it in some way. But, okay, what if I want to interact with just my friends and, and not you know, say that I'm a, I'm a legislator, I'm an elected official? Well, that's when you have to be a little more creative with your name, and you can have a private account. So when you set up your Twitter account, you can be public or private. Um, some of our well members are also Twitter users, and some of them also have uh, private accounts outside of their public accounts. And then you can just say interact with the people you know in person and talk about your two baby niece or your children getting engaged or any of the other things that you don't necessarily want your constituents reading about. Um, but Twitter offers that choice. And Facebook, um, because they want you to use your real name, it is a little bit more it is a bit more difficult to separate between the two. Um, but once again, you have the opportunity to set up a fan page or uh, a traditional account where you have friends. Uh, the fan page gives you more control over how people are interacting with your content. And even now, all of the various brands of social media allow you to set um, permissions on who can see what you share. Um, in Facebook, it is in the settings, you would look over here and you would look at security and you could assign who can see what I post. Uh, Twitter, it's pretty just public or private. Google Plus is good because you set up circles and you can share things with just certain circles. So as time goes on, these different networks are building in more separation between the public face and the private face. So as time goes on, you'll have more options. But hopefully what I've shared has given you an idea of different ways to separate the usage of the different accounts that you may maintain. Thank you, Jesse. I think we have time for just uh, one more question. And uh, this question is from Senator Sandy Pappas. And um, she asked specifically about Facebook and how can legislators use Facebook to reach out to cons cons excuse me, constituents uh, with content, and how do you drive more people to your page? So if you are someone who has been using Facebook for a long time, and maybe before you ran for office, or even perhaps in the beginning of running for office, and you have a lot of friends, and you want to post something from your account that is your, so we have your friend account, so I'm, I just want to just make sure that I'm very clear here. So we have a fan page, which is, you know, so and so number of likes, which is what I'm showing right now, which is the Women's Action for New Directions fan page. And look, here's Senator Pappas. And we also have, this is for our Women Legislators Lobby, which is set up like an individual account where you have friends and photos and different people can share in your wall and you can share links. So the way that Facebook treats information that comes out of this kind of an account and the way that it treats information that comes out of this kind of an account are a little bit different. You have access to a lot more data on the back end of who has clicked on what, who has seen what on this kind of a page than you do on an individual page. So let's say that you were a Minnesota Senate President, Sandra Pappas, and you had 1,000 friends. If you share something from your individual Facebook account, those people are going to see that, more or more likely to see that on their news feed than if you shared it from a fan page like this one, unless the fan page had posted a video or a photo. So there's that. There's a technical side to what you share, but like I said, it's really content and the genuineness of that content that spurs people to action. So events where you're reaching out to your constituents, be it a press event or maybe it's breaking ground for a new library or something like that, where people feel engaged, where they feel like their voice is being heard or that you're asking the community for an answer. So you can ask questions. You'll see this from many elected officials and different departments and even companies. They'll ask the people who follow them, their friends, you know, today is Valentine's Day. What is the story of your first book? Or, you know, this past Tuesday was Human Rights Day. You know, today is Human Rights Day and we're doing this. What is the story of how human rights have impacted you? Or what is it that you would like to see change in 
in human rights. It's that engagement. It's reaching out to your constituents and asking them to reply with a photo, with a message that helps get them to really want to engage with you. And the more people that start engaging with your content, the more people will start finding out about your content. So right now, we're kind of at a pretty low here. We've got 12 people talking about this. But if we bump on over to someone else's page, like we walked over here and say we had 40 million likes, we're going to have a lot more people talking about it. So in reaching out to your constituents, number one, you would want to prompt them with something. Ask them a question. What are policy changes that we need to see in Minnesota? Or maybe not call it policy, or call it something else. What do we need to change? Or just something simple, oh, the weather is cruddy today. How did you get to work? You can say anything from something incredibly profound to something very, very short and sweet. And you could have events and you could host them. But the more that we engage and the more that we interact with our followers and our fans, the more we're going to see that spiral out and bring more people to our community and more interaction from our community. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. I think that is a good note for us to wrap up on. Um, so thank you, Jesse, for all your insight that you shared about social media. And uh, thank you so much to everyone who joined us this afternoon. I know we still had a few more unanswered questions, and I'll make sure to get them to Jesse. Um, just wanted to remind everyone to be on the lookout for follow-up materials. When you exit the webinar today, there's going to be a survey, and we'd really appreciate any feedback you can offer about today's webinar. And we'll also send you an email with a recording of this webinar and additional information. And also wanted to remind you all that part two of this webinar series is taking place next Thursday, December 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And as Jesse said, she'll get more uh, into the tools and into the nuts and bolts of social media. So I hope that you all can join us again then. And with that, I'm going to end. And thank you again so much to everyone.